Hi, I'm Meredith Hutchison Hartley. I'm Emily Geddes. I'm Frank Hutchison. And welcome back to the Hidden History of Business podcast. And today we're going to talk about why 2016 is a special year. Why is that? It's because it's a leap year. And what does that mean? Well, you're so cheesy, you're <laughs> killing me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, leap we're year, legit historians. Okay, <laughs> leap year goes back to the fact that a solar year, which is the amount of time it takes the Earth to revolve completely around the sun, come back to where it started, is 365.2425 days. That's 11 minutes short of a quarter day. Now, if you take 365 and divide it by 7, you get 52 and one day extra. So you get 52 weeks, most people think is a year, but it's really 52 weeks in one day. That means that the same date each year progresses through the week. Be Monday one year, Tuesday the next year, Wednesday the third year, and so on. Except when you have a leap year, all the days following February 29th are going to be one day later. So they leap a day. And that's where we get the term leap year. You just explained what a solar calendar is, but solar calendars are not the only kind. There are also lunar and lunisolar calendars. So if a solar calendar is base, it bases a year on how long it takes for the Earth to go all the way around the sun once and come to the exact same position, a lunar calendar is based on the phases of the moon. So the time it takes to go from a totally new moon to another new moon, that is one month. That's why it's called the new moon. It's the beginning of the month. And then you have lunisolar calendars, which combine the two. Usually their year is based on the solar calendar, that revolution around the sun, but their months and their important festivals are based on the phases of the moon. Now, there are very few truly solely lunar calendars. The most common example would probably be one of the Islamic calendars, which is used for mostly for religious purposes, but is still the official calendar in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. This is based exclusively on the phases of the moon. There are 12 months, and that means that the beginning of the year changes to a different time within our solar calendar. So the beginning of the year may be in spring, and then in winter and fall. And it takes 33 Islamic years for the calendar to get back to where it was again, for the first day of the year to return to the same year for our solar calendar. Which is why uh, Islamic holidays such as Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, mm -hmm. the fasting, yep, month, they're at a different moves time every year. Yep, every yeah. year. Now, most calendars that are we call lunar are actually lunar solar. Um, examples are the Hebrew calendar, the Chinese calendar, Hindu, Thai. All of these tend to use, they sync up with the solar year, but they'll use the phases of the moon. So the third full moon determines when this festival is within that solar calendar. And actually that's how Easter is still determined. Exactly. Yes. The reason that Easter moves around constantly is because it's based on the Hebrew calendar, which says that it'll come after a certain full moon or a certain phase of the moon after that new year starts. And you see that also with other holidays in the Hebrew calendar, Yom Kippur. Well, yeah, all of, day. All of all the them. holidays, yeah. all of them are based on the phases of the moon, mm -hmm. but they'll occur, it kind of resets at the beginning of each year. But they also use the solar year, a jubilee mm -hmm. year, where um, people who had basically indentured themselves would be freed, the debts would be forgiven, and the jubilee year was seven times seven plus one, because mm -hmm. that was the one that was the jubilee year. So you'd finish your 49 years and then the next year would be a jubilee year. Yes. Yep. They combined both lunar and solar aspects to determine their calendar. The oldest known lunar calendar, what they think was found in Scotland, and it goes back to 8,000 BC, but there are some that may be as old as 17,000 years old in cave paintings. They believe that that was the earliest form of calendar used, wow. was the phases of the moon. So the Egyptians, as early as 4200 BC or so had created a calendar that looks remarkably similar to what we have today. They had 12 months of 30 days, plus they added five extra days at the end of the year. So they had a 365-day calendar, but it didn't actually make its way to Europe 
until we had Julius Caesar come along. The ancient Roman calendar was actually based on a 355 day year, mm -hmm. which we now know is 10 and a quarter days shorter than the solar year. Mm -hmm. To keep the calendar in line with the seasons, Roman officials were supposed to throw in an extra month every once in a while, but that didn't happen with very much consistency. So by the time Julius Caesar came along, they were really quite out of whack with the way things should be. So he consulted uh, several of his the best astronomers of the time, in particular one named Sosigenes, and they revamped the Roman calendar in about 46 BC. They redesigned it to include 12 months that they started counting in March. This is a quirky little fun fact. The reason that September, sept means seven, October, oct means eight, November, nov means nine, December, dec or des, des mm -hmm. yeah. means 10 um, is because they started counting in March. So mm -hmm. March, April, May, June, July, August, September was the seventh month. So this Julian calendar added those 10 days back in. So they came up with this 365 day year in these 12 months. And it also accounted for that extra almost quarter of a day by adding in a leap day every four years. They took a transition year where they added in three months to the calendar to catch up to where they were supposed to be. And then this new calendar took effect in 45 BC. Now, they messed up a little bit when they were implementing it, and so it was kind of inconsistent at the beginning, and they were adding this leap day every three years instead of every four years. So when Caesar Augustus came along, he fixed that by suspending the additional leap day in 10 BC and then reinstituting it in AD 4, and then every four years after that. One of the things Julius Caesar did when he was reorganizing this calendar is he took the fifth month at the time, which was called Quintilis for five, Quint, and renamed it July, Aww. Julius, after himself. Of course. And then Caesar Augustus came along and said, that was a great idea. Let's do that with the next month. So we came up with August. <laughs> you know. They're vanity months. Yes. Got to <laughs> stick your name on it somewhere. So anyways, Caesar's model helped realign the Roman calendar, but it still had that problem of that 0.2425 extra days there, not an even 0.25, which was corrected with the leap day every four years. Which turns so, out to be 11 minutes every year. Which doesn't seem like a whole lot, but it means you get off by a full day about every 128, 130 years mm -hmm. or so. So we still have that problem that we're going to have to deal with. By the 14th century, they'd gotten about, you know, 10 days off. So they figured this out, and, but they didn't quite know what to do with it until Pope Gregory came along. And Pope Gregory was in a position, being Pope, he had the authority to sort of tell everyone, hey, here's the calendar we're going to use because he could set when the feast days were going to be. Mm -hmm. So, and he also had the astronomers. You know, one of the big things, for example, when Galileo was being prosecuted by the church, it wasn't because he was wrong or they considered him wrong. They knew he was right. They just didn't want to disrupt society by having everyone all of a sudden find out that, hey, the earth is not the center of the universe, which they've been teaching because their astronomers had told them, hey, yeah, Galileo was right. So anyhow, their astronomers identified the problem, and so added 11 days to get things back in line. And then they made one more change. They said, since it turns out to be about off by one day every 128 years, well, what we'll do is we'll say every year divisible by four is a leap year, except if it can be divided by 100, it's not a leap year unless it can be divided by 400. Oh, my gosh. That's insane. So... so 17, 18, and 1900 were not leap years. No. But the 2000. year 2000 was. Yes. And so that that solves the problem for about 10,000 years. <laughs> and wow. then we'll have the problem again. We'll be off by a day. That is what you, where we are today. And most of the world now uses that calendar, even though there are other local calendars, but everyone is able to make the transition to the Gregorian calendar because that is basically the universal calendar that's used for business. And we might go back and take a look at why does anyone care about what day of the week it is, or even the month? Well, it goes back to those feast days. 
the Catholic Church was very interested in making sure the feast days were held on the right days. These feasts are very important. And if you don't get them right, you're going to be damned. Okay, but even beyond that, even beyond the religious aspect, feasts in every culture are massive money makers. People travel from all over to attend feasts. Frequently, they would come and stay in inns, or they would need to purchase specific items for these feast days. Many of them are tied to ritual celebrations. And this goes back to the Roman calendar as yes. well. Yep. And so being able to, you want to make sure that everyone is celebrating on the same day to maximize your profits as well. And another reason for it is that a lot of business, especially for like interest payments or whatnot, were also tied to those particular days because that was something that everybody knew that was the day. And you wanted to know when the rent was due. You wanted to be able to say you are late and you can't say we agreed it would be due on this date and you're late if you don't know what day it is. If You can't all agree on what the calendar is. And so you have these efforts to make the calendar more precise because you need it for business and for operation and for just keeping track of things. Even legal proceedings require an accurate date. Otherwise, you don't know exactly when things are happening or when they should be happening, and you have confusion. What this also illustrates, though, is that as we've come towards the modern day, you start looking at time being more and more precise because it's needed. It used to be that days and months were good enough. Then you get into the Middle Ages, where all of a sudden now the time of the day becomes important. But it's interesting that the first clocks only had an hour hand. Mm. The minute hand was not added until much later because people didn't need to have that type of division. It was either, you know, one o'clock, two o'clock, nine o'clock or whatever you have. If you take a look at what we are today and what is required, then what you have is all sorts of things, which if we can't keep time, we can't do. We all have cell phones. We all use computers. Timing is a very important, critical component of those. If you can't keep track of the time, and I mean down to the nanosecond, you can't communicate because they won't work. They have to sync. You know, we now use the term sync, which is synchronization. They have to talk to each other, and if they can't, you can't get any type of good communication. You have navigation. One of the great triumphs in navigation was being able to have an accurate timepiece so that they could determine longitude. That was back in the 1700s. Before then, you just sailed off and, hey, you hoped you hit the right place. But with accurate time, you could determine exactly where you were. I remember uh, reading about the USS Tang, which is an American submarine in the Pacific, a very famous one, and how they would talk about how they had to go to Japan. And they were always looking for a certain landmark. And they get there, and, wow, they hit it exactly where they thought they were going to be. And all they were doing was celestial navigation in those days. And then you have business. Think of all the time elements that are in business. We have the work day. You have to get there on time. Of course, you need traffic signals, which have to be synchronized. You have the work week. You have overtime pay. You have vacations. You have sick leave. All sorts of elements go into time. And even our electronic transfers these days are all based on time. And it all came about because people wanted to be able to make sure that they worshiped their gods on the right day. Now, there are some interesting traditions that we found as we were researching leap year. First of all, the first time, first thing I knew about leap year was from the plot of a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta called The Pirates of Penzance. Which we watched hundreds of times growing up. Kevin Klein and Linda Ronstadt. Oh, yes, that's the best one. It Absolutely. Was and they would go romping across the room <laughs> yes. with cat-like tread. Yeah, oh, it was so fun. As loud as we could. Still love that. Yes. But the, in case you don't know, the, the basic plot is that Frederick is indentured to a pirate band until his 21st birthday. He has reached his 21st year, and he has decided that he wants to leave the pirate life. He does not view it as a, a moral and ethical way of living, though he was bound by his duty He's to... He's a slave of duty! <laughs> but he, he wants to live a, a, a... What was it? An upright... A, what is it? A moral and upright life? Forevermore. Forevermore. Yes. So he's decided that he wants to leave the, this debauched existence of a pirate's life, and he is blocked when... The pirate king pulls out his paperwork 
and says, oh, no, 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 this doesn't say your 21st year. It says at your 21st birthday, and you were born on the 29th of February, so you've got to stick around until you are 84 years old. And that was our first introduction to the whole idea, this mm-hmm. whole concept of, of leap year. And, and of course, everything works out, and he gets the girl, and there's lovely singing and dancing. And there's a lot of delightful comedy along the way. Oh, oh yes. yes. Absolutely. But there are some interesting traditions that we found in our research. In some countries, especially before the modern era, when it was frowned upon for a woman to do the proposing, for her to be the um, initiator of a romantic proposal, um, February 29th in particular, but leap year in general, was con- it was considered uh, permissible for a woman to propose marriage. And then if the man refused, he was fined. He had to either give the money, or give the woman um, money or buy her a dress. One source said he had to purchase 12 pairs of gloves mm-hmm. for the woman uh, to hide her hands and her embarrassment that she is not engaged. She does not have an engagement ring. So um, embarrassing. Uh, hideous, isn't it? There were some, We found some sources that said the tradition originated as part of a deal between St. Bridget and St. Patrick in Ireland. And it varies depending on the country. Um, in Finland, if a wo- man refuses a woman's proposal on leap day, he's supposed to buy her the fabric for a skirt. Uh, however, in Greece, getting married in leap year, and particularly on February 29th, is considered extremely unlucky. So couples will avoid getting married at those times. There's some actually very humorous postcards that we found uh, that uh, allude to this this leap year woman proposal opportunity that we'll link to on the website. There's a, a woman capturing a man with a butterfly net in 1908. <laughs> uh, my favorite is the one of the two women sitting there almost rubbing their hands <laughs> together, waiting for the calendar to switch over. <laughs> that's yeah. that's definitely how we... we yes. Oh, absolutely. That's totally something women do. And that absolutely. was a perpetual uh, theme in the comic strip Little Abner and how uh, Mama Yoakum always managed to save her son from this by some tactic of delaying the event until sundown when it was no longer permissible. Right. Mm-hmm. Had a lot of traditions there with leap year simply because it's so unique and it's a special day and people take advantage of it. So when you reach February 29th this year, uh, just take a minute and... I don't know, raise a glass to all of the chaos and wild history of leap year. Propose to your boyfriend. Or Run. buy her a glove. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about the subject we discussed today, head on over to our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com. You can also find us on Facebook as the Hidden History of Business and find us on Twitter. Our handle is at Hidden Biz. That's at Hidden B-I-Z. And if you enjoyed this podcast or would like to give us some more feedback, head on over to iTunes or to our Facebook page. We love hearing from our listeners. And thank you so much for listening. 